Welcome. My name is Simon Burgess and I am on CEDA's State Advisory Council, but my day job is the General Manager of the Adelaide Convention Centre. I would firstly like to acknowledge that wherever you are around Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today's event on COVID-19 is being live streamed because like many organisations, CEDA has suspended attendance at public events. However, at this time of significant economic uncertainty, CEDA remains true to its purpose of providing platforms to inform and promote debate of critical issues, and that is why this event is being made available as a free live stream. Over the coming months, CEDA will be making a range of events across key issues in digital formats to ensure CEDA members and the community, more broadly, can access discussion on the most important issues impacting Australia's economic and social development. As details of those events are confirmed, they will be made available on the CEDA website, cedar.com.au, and I encourage you to check back for details. CEDA will also be producing regular podcasts and video interviews with leading experts and policymakers to ensure that you remain up to date with quality information on key issues impacting the economy and more broadly, and in key sectors such as health and resources. These will also be made available through the CEDA website. Today, like our, at our public events, you will still be able to interact with the speakers through our Q&A portal, which is available via the link on your screen. Click the link and add your questions for the speakers. I'd, now I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those online, as well as our speakers here, who, draw, who are drawn from across government, industry, academia and health to lead this important discussion. In particular, I would like to welcome the Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Stephen Marshall. It's my pleasure to hand over to today's Chair and KPMG partner, Rowan Roberts. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you, Simon. And welcome to today's live stream event, which I think is a very timely update on the coronavirus impacts and facts as we know them, because obviously these are changing on a hourly, if not minute by minute basis. We've got an excellent panel here for you today to speak to the nature of the virus itself, um, health impacts, economic impacts, and firstly, obviously, importantly, the government's response both at a Commonwealth and state level to this virus and its impacts as they are known right now. So I'd like to start by welcoming to the lectern the Honourable Stephen Marshall MP, Premier of South Australia, to talk about the government's response to this virus. Thank you, Premier. Thanks very much, Rowan. Thanks, Simon. And I too would like to acknowledge that this uh, podcast is coming to you from Adelaide. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we acknowledge their ongoing spiritual relationship with this uh, precious land. Well, we certainly live in extraordinary times uh, at the moment. Uh, and I'm so grateful to CEDA for pulling together this panel today so that we can be better informed about uh, the progress of the coronavirus, our preparedness uh, here in Australia, the likely health impacts, the likely economic impacts, so that we can all get on the same page. I must say, uh, like many people around the country, I've been tuned into social media uh, for the last couple of months on this issue, and it is extraordinarily concerning uh, the level of fake news that is circulating. My own daughter uh, was telling me about uh, my own Cabinet's preparedness uh, for a complete lockdown that I was going to be announcing today. Uh, this is complete and utter uh, fake news and so these types of forums when we can legitimately discuss what is going on and the government's response are very, very important. Number one, our priority as a state government and of course from a federal level is uh, to maintain the health, safety and welfare of all of our citizens. Uh, the coronavirus has now been declared by the World Health Organisation as a global pandemic. Uh, we are not going to escape it coming to Australia. It's already here. We're certainly not going to escape it uh, from coming to South Australia and having further spread. What, can, what we can do, though, is to try to con constrain uh, the progress of this disease. And we want to do this uh, because if we do this, we have a much better chance of putting all of our health resources in place so that when we reach the peak of the coronavirus uh, in Australia, we have all the necessary uh, medical resources in place to be able to treat all of those people who are likely to need uh, higher level uh, health care. 
Now, uh, the, it's true uh, that probably eight or nine out of every 10 people that get the coronavirus might have mild symptoms uh, like a normal cough and then they get through that and they're going to be immune. Uh, and in many ways, they're not the people that we are concerned about at this point. But there are vulnerable cohorts uh, in Australia and we've got to be very mindful about protecting them from the coronavirus uh, and making sure that we can provide uh, the highest level uh, health care should they become infected. They are our most vulnerable people. Um, so we've got to do everything we can uh, to minimise and protect, uh, minimise the spread, uh, put our resources in place and look after our vulnerable communi uh, communities. The Prime Minister on Friday last week at the COAG, the Council of Australian Government, decided that we would establish in Australia a national cabinet to um, deal with this coronavirus. And on that cabinet is the Prime Minister, the six premiers and the two uh, chief ministers. And this group is very important because what we do need is a coordinated, joined up national approach. We can't have um, an unsavoury auction between premiers and chief ministers as to who is going to be toughest. And in fact, what we need to have is a coordinated, joined up response, which is informed by the best and brightest uh, public health minds that we have uh, in this country. And that's precisely what's been put in place. And since that announcement was made on Friday last week, uh, we had a meeting on Sunday, uh, a long meeting last night and a further meeting to be held uh, of the National Cabinet uh, this Friday. So there's a lot of focus on this. Our expert input uh, is coming from the AHPPC, the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. Uh, and this is all the chief public health officers from around the country. And it's fair to say that at the moment they are working uh, in overdrive uh, to address some of the implications uh, that we are facing as a nation. Uh, now, last night's uh, National Cabinet meeting addressed some of these issues and the Prime Minister has already made some announcements today. And he has strong support uh, from the National Cabinet. Some of the announcements that he made this morning uh, relate to decisions that were made by the National Security Committee, a subcommittee of the Federal Cabinet yesterday. And in particular, the thing which is, uh, I, I suppose, the highest uh, profile is uh, a level for uh, travel uh, warning being put in place for all overseas travel. I mean, this is as high as you can go before you just say this is an outright uh, ban. We now have an extraordinary situation with a travel for uh, warning for all international uh, travel. Um, we also have uh, some changed arrangement, arrangements to industrial relations in so much as uh, some of the 20,000 international uh, nurses uh, that are doing work placements in Australia, so they're already in Australia, uh, but they can actually increase uh, their working hours from 40 hours a fortnight to 80 hours a fortnight. This expands the capacity and improves our preparedness for when we hit that peak uh, later in the year. Now, the issues that we considered at the National Cabinet last uh, night uh, dealt with schooling, dealt with uh, mass gatherings, uh, we dealt with the issue of aged care, Anzac Day, and also uh, travel in and out of uh, remote Indigenous uh, communities. So if I can just address uh, those, first of all, in terms of schools, uh, the overwhelming, uh, very clear uh, recommendation uh, from Dr Brendan Murphy, uh, who is uh, the chair of the AHPPC and attended last night's National Cabinet meeting was that schools must remain open. Uh, this wasn't uh, something we were asked to ponder. This was a very strong recommendation from the AHPPC and it's certainly one uh, that all states and the two territories strongly support. And of course, you've already heard from the Prime Minister today that he strongly supports that. There is simply no evidence uh, whatsoever that closing our schools would be helpful at this time. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that it would be extraordinarily unhelpful uh, for our nation as we come to grips with how we tackle this coronavirus. Uh, there have been plenty of suggestions, and I get a lot of suggestions uh, now, pretty much every five minutes on my phone. Somebody's got a great idea. People are suggesting, why don't you just close the schools uh, for two weeks? Uh, what's the point of closing them for two weeks? Uh, the reality is the coronavirus is still going to be there and Professor Brendan Murphy has now made it very clear that restrictions that are put in place are likely to be uh, in place for six months or longer. 
Uh, so what we've got to do is make sure that we can put uh, restrictions in place in a sensible and sustainable way, and that's precisely what we are going to do. We want to follow the trajectory of countries like Singapore, um, not some of the other countries that have had a rapid, uh, uncontrolled explosion uh, in uh, community transmission. Uh, Singapore is one of the countries which is really identified at the moment as best practice. They have their students at school. So we receive this advice, we're endorsing this advice, and we're asking the people of uh, South Australia and Australia to do the right thing and make sure that our children still go off to uh, school. The second area, of course, that we are very concerned about is aged care. This, these are the areas where we have, I suppose, our most fragile uh, population. It's not the only uh, fragile cohort, but it is certainly a very obvious one. And as of today, there will be further restrictions uh, for people visiting the aged care uh, sec, uh, uh, facilities. And these are sensible, they're logical, and I think, uh, by and large, uh, they will be very well respected by people going to visit uh, their family and loved ones in aged care facilities. So as of today, uh, people under the age of 16 will not be uh, attending those aged care facilities. Um, visitors will be restricted to two in a group. They'll go straight to the residence room or outside, but not into the common areas. There are further restrictions about the type of uh, people and the health uh, background of the people that are working in aged care uh, facilities. Um, and of course, there will be um, exemptions. Um, we have to be very mindful uh, at uh, the end of life and in palliative care that families do clearly uh, have access to loved ones, but uh, by and large we need to adopt a new model when visiting aged care facil uh, facilities for the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, Anzac Day, I think you, probably most people would have seen uh, the very sensible decision which was arrived at yesterday. Uh, Darren Chester, the Federal Minister for Veterans Affairs, convened a meeting of all of the Veterans Affairs Ministers in the states and territories uh, and it was decided that this year, with much regret, uh, the Dawn services, uh, which have been extraordinarily uh, popular in recent years as we commemorate this sacred and solemn uh, day for Australia, will not uh, be open to the general public. So in most jurisdictions, uh, I think that there will still be a Dawn service. Certainly here in South Australia, we will have a Dawn service uh, at the National War Memorial on North Terrace, but this will not be open to the general public. And again, the, the reasons are pretty obvious. Uh, the veterans community is, uh, by and large, an older and more vulnerable cohort, and coming in uh, to contact with, in some instances, thousands or tens of thousands uh, of people, often on a cold uh, morning, is not going to help uh, them uh, to uh, make sure that they can keep themselves protected for as long as possible. So. Uh, rather than um, you know, a lack of clarity on this issue, a decision has now been made that the Dawn services uh, will not be um, open as uh, open to the general public for this year. We also uh, had discussions, uh, of course, with regards to social distancing and mass gatherings. And we've got to say we are very, very grateful to the businesses in Australia who I think have already um, been very um, clear uh, about their, uh, their BCPs, their business continuity plans. Uh, increasingly, people are working from home. Um, I've met with lots of businesses and industry associations already this week uh, who are doing everything they can to uh, put these new norms and protocols into place as quickly as possible uh, so that we can minimise the risk of the spread of the coronavirus uh, in Australia. On... Um, Friday last week, the Prime Minister announced that there would no longer uh, be permitted, as of Monday this week, uh, any mass gatherings, non-essential mass gatherings above 500 people. He did provide some exemptions to that. In particular, he talked about schools and universities, uh, public transport and, of course, workplaces, uh, and also areas like shopping centres. Uh, but uh, as of Monday this week, uh, there was a new arrangement put in place which would essentially restrict um, any non-essential mass gatherings above 500. Now, we already know that some countries around the world have provided a differentiation uh, between uh, outdoor events and indoor events and static events and non-static events. 
And last night at the National Cabinet, we sought to put further clarity around this. So non-essential uh, mass gatherings uh, outdoor above 500 will no longer be permitted and mass gatherings uh, non-essential indoors above 100 uh, will not be uh, permitted. And we'll provide further guidelines regarding density uh, indoors, and that seems pretty logical if you think about it, because 100 uh, depends on the size of the room as to you know, uh, just uh, precisely uh, how effective it would be depending on the size of the room. Uh, we will provide some further clarity on that um, as soon as possible, potentially uh, by the end of this week. The final thing that we were really discussing uh, was the issue of public transport, and in particular in and out uh, of vulnerable uh, communities. Now, the evidence is uh, that uh, there is a very low risk of transmission on uh, air flights. Uh, nevertheless, um, some uh, thinking is now going to go into exactly what that means uh, because um, many uh, parts of Australia, in particular a remote and regional South Australia, do not have uh, infection uh, levels at the moment and they do have vulnerable communities and we want to make sure that we have the right uh, protocols and practices uh, around restricting uh, access into those areas. In my own state, uh, on the Ananu Pitinjara Yunkinjara lands, the APY lands, we've already put in additional restrictions for people going onto the APY lands because we know that there is a fragile uh, population in there and we know that there are very limited health services uh, provided onto the APY lands. And so we are increasing, if you like, the threshold at which people can uh, enter uh, onto the APY lands. And that's sensible. So that's where we are. It's a very different and changed situation than we had uh, last week. Uh, this is moving very quickly. But I think the very clear picture is that we want to do everything we can uh, to slow the spread of this disease so that we can get all of the necessary uh, resources in place so that we can cope with the peak. And when we talk about those necessary resources, uh, we're talking about intensive care and critical care uh, beds, ventilators, ECMO uh, capability, the right healthcare workers in place in the quantities to meet the projected demand. So in summary, flatten uh, the projected uh, peak demand, push it out as far as possible, put those resources uh, in place. From a state government's perspective, we also need to be very mindful about providing quality uh, awareness and education. Uh, there are going to be lots of change practices in workplaces, in communities and homes. Uh, and we're asking people to come along with us. Uh, we're also going to have to put in a place a very strong economic stimulus. We do not want to have the dual crises, uh, essentially a health crisis and also simultaneously a massive uh, unemployment spike. So we're going to be doing everything we can at the federal and the state level and not to put projects in place for two, three and five years but for immediate stimulus to keep people um, employed uh, and to make sure uh, that we keep our economy moving. This is critical. Uh, if our economy slows down or in fact if our economy is compromised, uh, this is going to have further compounding impacts upon those people that are vulnerable. One of the things that the National Coordination Mechanism, the NCM, is looking at at the moment is food, grocery and supply chain. These are really important things for us to make sure that we can continue to offer. Um, it will be absolutely critical going forward. And I want to conclude by talking about, I think, one of the Prime Minister's strongest points, and that is uh, we need to make sure that we don't buy into the panic and listen to uh, the fake news. Uh, we are very concerned when we see images of people at shopping centres uh, basically hoarding food, uh, stocking up for the next six months. There is absolutely uh, no suggestion whatsoever that Australia is going into uh, a crazy lockdown with the ADF on every street corner making sure that nobody leaves their home and go to the grocery store. We can uh, stock up uh, sensibly uh, if that will alleviate some of the anxiety. But I personally did my own shopping uh, on the weekend, on Saturday, and I did it in a hand basket. I'm probably as informed as most people about what is likely to come. I certainly don't have that level of anxiety. The Prime Minister really called this issue out this morning. Uh, he said it was unhelpful. In fact, I think he almost said it's un-Australian. We've got to look after each other, and that doesn't mean uh, going and fighting over toilet rolls. 
uh, in shopping centres. It means sensibly uh, preparing and making sure that we can follow the instructions. And I think that that is very good advice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Premier. I think you're absolutely right that people are looking for that clarity of communication from leadership right now and that fake news is, as always, a problem. Um, on the way to this event, I saw people walking down the street listening to the Prime Minister giving his press conference on their phones, sharing it with their colleagues, but not too closely. So people are definitely seeking the level of information that you've just provided. So thank you very much for coming to share that in this forum with us. Um, before we go to our next speaker, there are questions starting to come through, but just want to remind people that if they would like to send additional questions through, they can go to cedar.pigeonhole.at and enter the password coronavirus to ask their questions and vote for their preferred questions, and we will take those questions in the Q&A session. But next, we'll be moving to additional um, input from our panel members. So I would like to welcome now Associate Professor Michael uh, Beard, who is the head of the Viral Pathogenesis Research Laboratory at the University of Adelaide, to talk to us about the virus itself, the nature of the virus, how it spreads, what are the facts that we need to know right now. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for that in introduction. And also thanks to CEDA for inviting me to uh, come and, and talk to you today. We're going to hear a lot about the economic impact that this, uh, the virus is, is having. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the, the virus itself and sort of a more of a, a medical slant, if you like. I think it's important that we really have some sort of level of understanding of, of what we're dealing with here. So I have some uh, slides that I'm going to share with you and we'll walk through those slides and, um, and go from there. So... This is a tall ask in, in the five minutes that I've been given, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll do our best. So coronavirus, what, what are we in fact um, dealing with? Most of you would know that we're dealing with a coronavirus, but what is it exactly? So most of you are probably unaware that you're actually being, all being infected with a form of coronavirus at some stage in your life. So you're definitely infected when you're very young, and there are four strains of this virus <coughs> that uh, are responsible for the, uh, the common cold, and they're shown, shown here. And in this instance, it generally infects the upper respiratory tract, and that's why you get uh, the, the, com the common cold. Now, the issue with this is, or, is that you develop immunity to this virus. So on subsequent infection, you get a very, very mild um, disease. The problem with the current um, pandemic, uh, with uh, SARS coronavirus 2, is that this virus has actually jumped from animals. And so when it does this, uh, we don't have any immunity to this virus. And this is why we're seeing such a large problem uh, in, in the community uh, at, at large. It also behaves very different to the uh, coronaviruses that were infected as part of the common cold. It goes deep into the lung, um, shown, shown here, and causes uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ADRS. And that is a, a significant problem, certainly for the elderly uh, who are, are infected. So where did this all begin? We all knew it began in, in Wuhan, in, in the Hubei province in, in China. And it's most likely transmitted um, from, from bats. Now, over the period or the, or the course of, of 20 years, we've seen two other instances where the coronavirus has moved from a bat population into an animal population. The first one was SARS and then MERS, 2009 and 2002 respectively. And these viruses had very, very high mortality. These viruses jumped into animals such as civet cats and camels and then they went on to, to infect humans. There's been a lot of speculation as to what the intermediary animal is in the current outbreak <clears throat> and there's certain uh, implications for an animal called a pangolin, but I think we still don't know what that animal is, and that's the course uh, of, of uh, a lot of investigation. So that raises the question, will this happen again? And I think history will tell us, yes, it will happen again, but we don't know when. So there's a lot of um, work going on to actually try and work out when it will happen again through ge um, genomic and genetic surveillance of viruses in the wild. And I think while we, while we continue to um, mix with wild animals, certainly, in these markets and when we encroach on the space of wild animals, um, this will continue uh, to occur. This is a, clearly a global spread and I think that's not new to anyone, but I put this slide up just to show you 
the impact of this virus and how it, uh, it, it, it travels across the world incredibly quickly. So, for example, on January 30, shown here in this slide, we had 8,000 infections and 171 deaths. And just six weeks later, we're up to 169,000 infected and 6,500 deaths. And you can see here that the virus has spread from China, which was the hotspot, to all throughout the world, and, and purely due to human travel. What are the, occur the current Australian uh, statistics or the status? <clears throat> As of, uh, I think, today, and this is a, a moving uh, target, if you like, it's currently being updated on an hourly basis. But I think as of uh, today, we're up to about 450-odd cases in Australia. This is not significant on a worldwide scale, but it's telling us that we need to be very vigilant in what we're doing and we need to act now to keep these numbers relatively low. This curve is particularly um, concerning. And you can see here in states such as New South Wales, uh, Victoria and Queensland, we're starting to see this exponential growth or, or infections that, that, that are occurring. So the numbers of uh, people infected seem to be uh, doubling every uh, two to three days. In South Australia, we're a little, little bit lucky at the moment. We have roughly about 30 cases uh, of, of, of viral infection. And this gives us time in this state to actually put in things to place to try and keep that number down. That number will increase, of course, over time. Um, but I think the message for this is because these numbers are still relatively low, now is the time to certainly act. Are things that we do effective? And this slide just shows you, for example, how travel ban bans were very effective in curbing the spread of this virus. So things that we, we do, do have an effect. Like we can see here that when we introduced travel bans from China, Italy and, and Iran, we dropped those cases significantly coming from those countries. That's a little bit of a no-brainer. But essentially, um, we stop those, that, that spread in, into the country. The US is a problem. Uh, it represents the, the greatest number of cases coming into Australia. But we now have those uh, quarantine uh, measures in place to try and uh, mitigate the risk of those people spreading the virus into the community. So what are we doing to slow this, uh, this epidemic in our, in our, in our state and, and in Australia? We're putting in, pu in place public health measures and social distancing is a key. We keep hearing about this time and time again. Now is the time to really start practising those social distancing measures and that's exemplified by this meeting going to a live stream. Uh, many people are now working um, from home and having good hygiene such as washing hands, etc. And I think we've been um, bombarded uh, with those messages. You need to take heed of what's happening. So what does that mean? And what we're really trying to do is, is flatten the curve, as the Premier indicated. And this just shows you graphically what that means. You'll hear about this from time to time. And really what it is is to spread that infection out and to give us time, give our health system time to cope with the infections and also our diagnostic capabilities time to actually diagnose those patients that definitely need to be diagnosed quickly uh, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner. Unless we do this, our hospital systems will be over, overwhelmed, there is no question. You just have to look at the cases of what's happening in Italy and we do not want that happening uh, in, in Australia. So when will we have a vaccine? This is the question that people probably ask me most. I think we're probably uh, 12 months to uh, 18 months away from, from getting a vaccine. That is, that is realistic. Um, and this is just a list here. There are currently 35 companies within at uh, the world at the moment who are trying to develop a vaccine. So it's a very active area of research, but it still takes time. You can generate a vaccine relatively quickly, but it's the regulatory factors and all the um, uh, other things that you need to do uh, for getting a vaccine out into the population that take time. What are we doing in Australia? Well, we are at the forefront of, of vaccine design. And certainly I've put this picture up uh, of a, a group in Queensland at the University of Queensland who are very actively um, looking at uh, developing a vaccine. They will be going into clinical and animal trials very soon, I hear. So um, that's we have to pin some hopes on, on, our, on our medical researchers. How long will it be with us? And I'd like to finish up here. I think it will be with us for some time. Um, it certainly will be uh, a couple of months at least and possibly longer. And I think we have to uh, 
weather the storm uh, for some time to come. But how long, we, we just don't know. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. We are starting to get some questions coming in exactly on that topic of how long do we think this storm is going to last. So that might well be something that we come back to in terms of the advice that um, government is receiving on that issue during the, the panel session. But before we get to the panel, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Mark Duffy, who is the Chief Executive of the Department of Innovation and Skills, to talk to us about the stimulus response and economic impacts more broadly of the virus. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much and uh, thanks to CETA for inviting us to talk about uh, the most significant economic uh, and health issue that uh, will face this generation, I suspect. Um, I want to make just a few general observations first about the governance changes that I've seen as a public servant because um, what, what we're observing is the Australian and South Australian government's um, rapid response and the incredibly effective public sector um, support for those policy responses and directions. I've been in and out of the public sector longer than I care to admit, um, but I've, I've never been prouder to be a public servant than I have been watching the dedication, the intelligence and the effectiveness of, of public sector individuals as they go about their task. I think one of the upsides of this over time is we're going to develop a newfound respect for the absolutely critical importance of a public sector uh, as, the, as, the, as the steering um, organisation in a highly complicated complex economy and, and community. So we'll see, we can talk more about that later, but there's, there's a number of changes we'll see in behaviour as, as a result of what we're going through, and that would be one of them from my point of view. Um, the, the Premier has referred to the National Cabinet. Again, I think the messaging about the National Cabinet, um, about um, reassuring the, the public about good governance and the consensus. I think the consensus that the Prime Minister expressed today about the unanimity around, for instance, the question of school closures um, is go, will go a long way to, to wind um, uh, unnecessary panic down when people can see that the governments, on the one hand, are open to the idea that they're moving with data, um, uh, but but at, as they get to each step, they're, they're quite firm and, and well articulating the position, which gets me to my third point, which I also think is very important and hopefully a change that will continue, is that we're seeing the experts in front of the cameras and uh, welcome back experts, because these are not issues that can be resolved by ideology or politics. They're based on facts, on argument and on analysis. And if we can work through this as a community, there will be very few other public issues that we won't be able to tackle. So the exercise of listening to experts, having a, a civilised discourse, um, a bipartisan approach, a federal state unity of approach is an enormous leap forward from where we've been in the last 10 years if you think about some of the uh, issues that the community and the political system have failed to deal with. I don't need to name them. I think we all know what some of those are. Um, the, the issue about the economic impact of this, I think we need to think about it differently from any other event because, and I don't want to say this flippantly, this is not, this is not an, an economic event that is being caused in the private sector for economic reasons. This is a series of, of synchronised national and international policy responses to a threat which is of enormous proportions and to some degree, I, I want to use this phrase very carefully, to some degree we're inducing a short-term economic coma in order to deal with the virus. Uh, and the way the governments deal with that is, as you're seeing today, as you'll see tomorrow and the next day, the first stimulus package, the response to the airline industry this morning, we have to protect our in economic infrastructure as we absorb and manage this virus so this is very much uh, effectively the economic outcome of having to deal with a health issue. That is to say it's being induced by policy and therefore we should think about it differently. So when I'm asked the question, will the stimulus package avoid a recession, that's not really the question to me. The question is 
what is the best way of us protecting our long-term economic uh, infrastructure so that we bounce back as soon as we can, as soon as people, uh, as soon as we get on the other side of that hopefully much flatter curve that we've discussed today. That to me is the key. So, you know, just to give you an example, a $17.5 billion stimulus package, I think it was released last Thursday, that's six days ago. Um, I hope the Australian Financial Review will forgive me if I say that uh, the following day the Financial Review said most economists think this will prevent a recession and I suspect that this week we'll have another large stimulus package. That is how fast this is moving. That's not a criticism of the Australian Financial Review. It is to say that, again, the data is driving decisions and decision-making is happening very rapidly. So to, to see uh, the closure of Rex. Uh, yesterday and a, almost a three-quarters of a billion dollar um, support package today shows you how ably and how quickly governments will respond to this. So uh, I guess I don't want to spend too much time because we can pick this up in questions, but we need to think about the economic events now as completely different from the Great Depression or from uh, uh, recessions or other language that we're using because we are driving this on policy grounds and we will drive it back up on policy grounds and the evidence that I can see to date is that the government, federally and state and the public service are working in beautiful lockstep to try and bring this to a nice landing. Thank you very much, Mark. And yes, we will definitely come back to some of those themes in the questions. Um, one of the industries that was obviously um, an early casualty of this and was known as, I guess, one of the canaries in the coal mines as this approached um, was the higher education sector. And so I'd like to welcome Karen Kent to speak to us today about impacts on the higher education sector and the responses that we've seen from that sector to date in relation to international students. Karen Kent is the Chief Executive Officer of Study Adelaide. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Rowan, and, and thank you, Cedar, for the opportunity to be here today. So, yes, um, I would like to take people back to the uh, 1st of February, which seems like a long time ago now, when the travel ban from China was actually announced without warning. And, um, in fact, I think I found out from the Premier in, in, a, in a text that he sent me, and I think I made the understatement of the year when I said, well, this will be a very challenging time for the sector. Um, but, of course, it has evolved since then, as we all know um, and are hearing about today. So understanding who was impacted became the immediate need, specifically which students were onshore versus offshore. Um, so while it was predominantly university students because of the timing of the semester start dates, other cohorts have been impacted and including some school students and for those studying year 12, it's been a particularly challenging and, and distressing time. So data eventually revealed that over 50% or more than 100,000 Chinese students enrolled to study in Australia were offshore. In South Australia, it was almost 5,900. But as soon as that travel ban was announced, universities set about making individual contact with each student impacted. And while the initial approach um, from all of us was planning for scenar scenarios, if the travel ban was lifted in a week or two, we were still being quite optimistic, you know, it soon became apparent that um, that wasn't going to happen. And then the focus shifted to personalised study solutions, as well as supporting those students here in Australia who obviously have a lot of concern for their friends and family back home. So solutions such as delayed commencement of semester start dates, allowing deferrals to semester two, uh, online learning delivery, which of course is being critical at the moment, and, and payment flexibility were put in place. So all providers, universities and schools and so on have, in my opinion, demonstrated really compassion and care to Chinese and other student cohorts who are now affected. So authentic messages of support and flexibility are very much appreciated and very much align well to Australia's brand. And that's going to be very important for long-term recovery. Initial sentiment amongst Chinese students was quite negative. Um, Australia was not viewed favourably for being one of the first to move in terms of closing the border. Um, and it remains to be seen whether this has implications longer term. But of course, I think we all appreciate why and we've seen from those graphs why that decision was made. However, now that the situation is global, the negative sentiment um, has certainly dissipated. So the sector has come together um, and one of those um, actions has been through the establishment of a global reputation task force established by the Minister for Education, which was actually established just prior to the 1st of February travel ban. 
Um, and it involves a range of commun- uh, Commonwealth agencies, including the Department of Health and Home Affairs and, and of course, Education and Austrade, state and territory and industry representatives. So this task force to date has dealt with common issues across Australia, um, such as student visas, you know, rectifying scenarios um, such as incorrect visa cancellations and seeking clear and proactive messaging for students, education agents and providers. From a marketing and market engagement perspective, Austrade works very closely with the states and territories to aggregate information and communications. And one of the biggest challenges for students has been the plethora of information, and I think we're hearing about that today. Not all of it has been consistent, and that is that is clearly one of our biggest challenges. Uh, there's been some proactive campaign activities, such as a hashtag in this together campaign, which was designed to deliver those messages of, of support in the early days and, and ongoing. And we certainly had activated similar messages of support from the Premier and, and, and other people here in South Australia. So over the past couple of weeks, looking at more recent times, universities and other providers have had to deal with um, additional countries added to the travel ban and support for those international students. And of course, today we've had um, a new announcement again, Australian students on on outbound mobility programs in high risk countries. And of course, now in every country, universities are working uh, to support those students. Um, There are also many Chinese students who are still arriving via third countries, which was a a bit of a workaround in relation to that travel ban. If they were outside mainland China for 14 days, they could enter Australia. So as a destination marketing agency, we're now currently turning our attention to those various scenarios of destination support for students as they return. So we're working closely with our member institutions to explore options for students to self-isolate, for example, who to supplement those arrangements that um, universities and schools are securing to support those students. And of course, this week, uh, education institutions are planning for a reduced presence on campus, such as all lectures and tutorials delivered online and non-academic staff working from home. So while the concern has first and foremost been for the students um, and supporting them to, de- to determine the best way forward, there is, of course, a significant economic impact, um, both at the micro level, so for institutions and, and the macro level in terms of their flow on impact to the community through retail, restaurants, tourism and so on. If all goes well over the next few months, um, most of these students will return to complete their studies here, which means that the revenue is deferred, but obviously that uh, macro uh, impact will, will be lost. So students who have partially completed their degree have a very strong motivation to return. They've made that investment here in Australia. They've made that financial investment in their education. Um, and even those who are about to commence have already made a significant estimate, investment in time and effort and choice and, and applying for visas and so on. But the greater concern is for the long term. So marketing and recruitment efforts for 2021 are constrained. Uh, There's a risk that those in the pipeline will change their minds. Traditionally, our competitors have been the US, um, UK and Canada, and neither the UK nor Canada imposed a travel ban from China. Um, And UK had reintroduced some attractive policy settings for international students. But of course, as I said, we we do understand why those decisions were made here. And it will be very interesting now to monitor how well or otherwise those countries manage the COVID-19 situation because safety is a critical factor for Chinese parents and students. Uh, In fact, a lot of uh, cohorts, of course, everyone, let's face it, um, when choosing a study destination, particularly when your child is in another country. And this goes for Australia too. Our our global reputation will be impacted by how well we respond to this situation, our community response and how we're behaving and reacting as a society. I think our behaviours are very much on show. So just finally, international education is Australia's fourth largest export for us um, after coal, iron ore and natural gas. And for South Australia, it's our largest export. Um, and managing our relationship with our international student markets, particularly China, is is really critical to the sector's future and to the future prosperity of Australia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And amazing to see such a large institutional um, base of an industry respond to a crisis like this with such speed and flexibility. Um, it's been quite something to watch as an outsider. Um, I'd like to welcome now Chris Sweet, who's a partner at Finlayson's in the health law industry, give his reflections on what he's seeing in that industry. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Rowan, and thank you, CEDA, for asking me to come and present. Um, Australia, like many countries at this time, is facing one of the most significant challenges for its health sector uh, in responding to the coronavirus pandemic. For the health system to succeed, 
It's going to require the support of the whole community, and we've had that message uh, in the press for a long time now, taking responsible measures for isolation and control of the spread of the disease. Um, we've seen um, steps such as emergency powers being enacted across the country. Um, for instance, in South Australia, we've got our own, uh, as many states have, and these measures are absolutely important amongst, uh, amongst others to allow our public and private health services to continue to function properly and efficiently for the duration of the pandemic, which uh, looks like it's going to be with us for some months now. While clearly dealing with the pandemic and the coronavirus is about everyone's health and, and, and achieving it efficiently, um, for the health sector it's also as much about uh, managing risk, managing priorities and complex competing interests. I just wanted to mention some of the, uh, the impacts on those competing interests that uh, the health sector is facing at the moment. Providing increased intensive care facilities, staff and equipment for treating coronavirus while at the same time maintaining existing health services. That is a really big challenge, particularly uh, with the uh, flu season um, uh, approaching um, in the uh, near future. This challenge uh, is what is likely to continue to drive um, escalating social isolation, things like border quarantine, border control in this country and others. And what we're going to see more of, and we've already seen a little bit of it already, is senior medical uh, officers from various states um, uh, in the press encouraging everyone to uh, get on board uh, and, um, and try and assist with, uh, with more isolation uh, as possible. Um, other things are preparing and commissioning uh, things like special isolation health facilities to care for coronavirus patients, which have to be separate from the general patient population. That's an essential priority at the moment and it's being addressed as an essential priority. Uh, and, there's, uh, and it's the significant focus of health resource um, as those preparations occur and as um, concern increases about the uh, pattern of this uh, potential uh, disease. Um, maintaining a healthy and able workforce to meet the demand for patient care while also meeting social isolation measures uh, which the general population are adopting. Many businesses at this time are responding to their duty of care to the workforce by cancelling face-to-face -face meetings and, and we've heard some some new measures today uh, from the government about that uh, in favour of technology and many are adopting a remote working model. There are a lot of businesses very responsibly um, who are um, starting to adopt uh, a remote working model uh, or, or hybrids of a, a similar model. In health, the challenges of social, social isolation are much more complex outside of the isolation ward in a hospital, say, particularly when it comes to high risk patients and particularly in the community setting. So a lot of, uh, of resources going into dealing with that at the moment. Um, uh, you would be aware from the press, uh, for instance, that uh, uh, travel for health workers, I think in most states, is now pretty much on hold while, um, while the workforce gets ready to meet potential demand. And we've heard from the Premier this morning that there are some additional measures on the industrial front taking place with, uh, with the nursing profession. In the case of the private health sector, um, I think there's going to be a, a particular challenge potentially uh, with the impact of elective uh, procedures potentially uh, uh, being cancelled by patients uh, who are um, isolating themselves as part of their uh, own uh, personal isolation measures. Uh, what that looks like, um, it's very difficult to say at the moment, but as businesses, health, uh, private health facilities and providers also are going to have to deal with the economic impact of coronavirus, uh, like many others uh, in the audience. Uh, in terms of private health insurance, uh, while we're on the topic of private health, the impact of the coronavirus is uh, unknown at this stage, uh, but uh, uh, notably the Insurance Council of Australia uh, have declared the coronavirus uh, at catastrophic level, um, and that will enable uh, certainly the insurance industry to gather relevant data to determine the impact of coronavirus and in the industry's response and no doubt there'll be some um, publication of information in the long term about that. Uh, just finally, balancing the type and extent of social isolation uh, recommendations necessary to slow and contain the spread of coronavirus which uh, generally uh, and reduces impact, balancing that against economic consequences uh, is something which health has to deal with as well. Um, what we're seeing on an increasing basis, particularly with coronavirus, is that epidemiology studies and forecast modelling 
is playing a key part in determining the extent of social isolation controls across the world. And, and we've seen a lot of publications almost daily in articles uh, about the modelling of, uh, of this disease. And it's very important, but obviously uh, those measures come at a cost to the economy. Um, just finally, as you'd expect, a significant amount of resource activity and planning has occurred and is continuing to occur to prepare to effectively deal with the potential demands on the health system. Uh, what is uh, required by the health system um, a great deal at the moment is whole community engagement um, in dealing with isolation issues um, to improve the ability of our health system to effectively deliver care to those who most need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and um, thank you to all of our panellists, in fact. The questions have been coming in thick and fast as you've all been speaking, so I'll turn now to some of the questions that have been coming into the portal. Some of this we've touched on already in terms of the, the expected duration of this event, but the top-rated question at the moment coming in is what are the forecasts for peak COVID-19 uh, and what are business and government currently working to as a return to normal date? Uh, that might be a how long is a piece of string question, but I'd be keen for the views on the panel of what they've heard, what they've been briefed on and what their general expectations are about the, the length of this event. Don't know who would like to start with that, Premier? various models and it really all depends on the progress uh, of the community transmission of the disease. Um, at the moment we're likely to hit uh, a peak towards the, the middle of this year uh, and for those reasons I think it's reasonable that Professor Brendan Murphy and the Prime Minister today talked about the restrictions that are being put in place at the moment are likely to be restrictions that are going to be in place uh, for six months or more. Uh, and this really uh, I think you know makes clear uh, that some of the uh, suggestions that have been coming forward about closing schools for two weeks or having an extended uh, school holiday break just make no sense uh, whatsoever. This is not something we're going to go in and out of very quickly. In fact, it would be very dangerous to go in and out of this uh, particular uh, pandemic very quickly. It is possible to go in and out very quickly, but you'll have a massive, massive mortality rate because there will be this, if you like, this disconnect between the demand, the peak demand, uh, for high level medical uh, services and the capacity to supply. But again, I just emphasise that, you know, eight out of every 10 people that get this disease will have very mild uh, symptoms. It's like a common cold that you would get over very quickly. Um, I'm sure if any of us on this panel got it, um, quite frankly, we would get over it uh, within a week uh, and we'd be immune. Uh, the reality is though, we do have particularly vulnerable cohorts uh, and they would be uh, very, very susceptible. People that might be having chemotherapy, people that might uh, have respiratory illness, people that are older, veterans. Um, there are a range of people who have greater fragility. That is the cohort that we're trying to protect. And by slowing this uh, disease down, and believe me, our, our major focus on the National Cabinet is to delay the onset of the peak for as long as possible so that we can get all of those necessary resources in place. Thank you, Premier. And in your response, you've touched actually on one of the questions that's also come in, um, which is, can you confirm with surety that if you have the COVID-19 virus once, you cannot get it again and will be immune? Michael, I don't know, is that something that you're in a position to comment on? The data would suggest that that is, that is true. But it, it's still very early days yet, so we, we just don't know about that. I think there's some data that's come out recently showing that uh, if you are infected with this virus, you, you do generate a strong immune response. And so you would assume that that would be the case, but I think we still don't have enough data to, to tell us if that's exactly going to be the case. Okay. Um, we've got another question that's come in around transmission and the places of highest risk for transmission. So the question is, using existing case data, what do we know to date about whether most cases are transmitted in workplaces during work duties or at mass gatherings and places where more people um, come together in large numbers? That the two bans that are in place in terms of outdoor gatherings and indoor gatherings obviously mean that government has been turning its attention to these issues at a national level. Premier, any, any comment from you before we perhaps go to Michael? Yeah, look, um, what I would say is um, to date in South Australia of the 32 confirmed cases, there is just no um, evidence of community mm -hmm. transmission. And what we mean by that is 
an unknown source mm. uh, of that transmission. So somebody picking it up in their, their daily activities and, and really not being able to trace it back to the origin. Uh, in fact, I think um, off the top of my head, 30 of the 32 cases are directly related to international travel. And as you now know, we have these very significant restrictions. If you come back from overseas, uh, even if you're an Australian citizen, you have to self-isolate now for 14 days. This is compulsory and there will be police checks to make sure that you're abiding by uh, that. And we, we don't take these decisions lightly, but we do it because we know that this will definitely slow uh, the transmission. In other states of Australia, though, there is already community transmission, uh, and so that is more worrying. Uh, and as one of the earlier speakers said, we are you know, in, in somewhat of a fortunate position uh, in so much as we lag quite a way behind the front of this disease internationally, and South Australia lags even further behind the front. And so we can really learn the lessons mm. uh, in terms of slowing the spread of this disease uh, from the, uh, the countries that have done it well. We can also learn the lessons from those countries which have done it poorly uh, and we can put uh, some of the learnings in those other jurisdictions uh, into place. But what we're trying to do at the moment is to get ahead of the curve. Uh, and so we know uh, that it's very likely uh, that when there are mass gatherings, and we've now put some parameters around that, that, is a, that, is a very, that, is, that will increase the risk of this community transmission. And there's no point in putting it in place a day before it's needed because we're going to have to learn some new ways of operating and that's what these recommendations from the AHBPC are all about. Any other comments on transmission before we move um, to some new Just questions? to say that this virus is very infective if you like, if you want to use that term. It's probably uh, three to four times more than the flu. So if you can use that as a baseline. And I think the example of, of how infective it is, is, is the, the case with the cruise ships. Mm. Mm. So here was a case where we had a whole lot of people on board a cruise mm. ship and we thought we were quarantining them, but in fact we were actually just providing a Constant. large incubator, if you like, for the virus. And so that virus spread through that cruise ship quite rapidly. So that gives you an example of how infective that the virus can be. And on that, what you've just said, that is this worse than the flu? That is something that I'm hearing again and again and again, and to your point about fake news, Premier. Yeah. Um, I guess a definitive answer to that question of is this worse than the flu? Because there are people that seem to be on the, the range from very blasé mm -hmm. to extremely paranoid, and finding the right place to be in that spectrum is difficult for some. So are you able to get to that question of is this worse than the flu? Yeah, so people say, well, oh, this is going to be like the flu, as, you, as you've mentioned. Why do we need to worry? Well, we need to worry because we don't know a lot about this mm -hmm. virus. We, we know a lot about the flu. We've been studying flu for many years. We have a vaccine against the flu and we have some antivirals against the flu. So we can target our elderly, for example, with, with vaccines and we can protect them, but we can't do that with, with this virus. And so that's why uh, there is the concern um, about this, this virus. It also has a case fatality rate that is much, much higher than the flu. So the flu is about 0.1. Uh, this is ranging anywhere between 1 to 3.5, depending on which community or which country is the virus is infecting. And, and so it is a lot worse than the flu. And it's fair to say that that range in those mortality rates is linked to the way in which those countries are responding and whether they're able to get ahead of the curve, so to yeah, speak, so in terms of the system you're exactly, response. You're, ex you're, you're right there. But the case is in Italy where the, the case fatality rate is quite high is because they have quite an ageing population. Um, their case fatality rate was up around 7%, mm. I think. Then if you look at Germany, who, got, who has had very proactive measures, their case fatality rate is just under one. So it all depends on the things you put in place now and the vulnerability of your population. And we've heard from the Premier about the measures in place around aged care. There's a question that's come in though um, about children um, in the sense that what do we do about places where social distancing is not possible, for example, childcare mm. centres? What does this mean for the staff at those centres and presumably for the children at those centres? I'd be open to comments from any of the panel on that. Well, again, the AHPPC advice is very clear. It wasn't equivocal in any way. And, and they are saying that at this point, uh, their strong advice is that children stay at school and children stay uh, at, their, uh, at their kindy or their early childhood uh, centre. And, and look, we're trying to make sure that we're not making uh, political or ideological decisions uh, in the middle of this coronavirus uh, pandemic and that we are listening to the epidemiologists, we are listening to these very, very smart and well-informed public health uh, administrators 
uh, and professionals, they are providing this advice to the National Cabinet and that's what we're adopting. Now, it's not to say that this um, won't uh, change uh, over time, but when um, there have been studies uh, in previous um, epidemics of countries that keep their children at school and uh, children, uh, countries that don't, uh, the evidence suggests that those that keep them at school do better overall. And that's certainly, um, if, as I was saying earlier, the evidence for um, Singapore, which I think most people around the world are you know, highlighting as a best practice example of how to deal and control uh, with the, uh, the coronavirus. Don't forget they were a lot earlier mm. on the curve than Australia, so they didn't even have the benefit of learning from other um, uh, countries. They, they put uh, their uh, protocols in place very early, and one of them uh, was to keep children at school. One more question on this. Well, not one more. We've got questions coming in, so I can't guarantee it's only one more. But um, in terms of the spread and community transmission and the comments that you've just made um, earlier, Premier, about of the 32 cases, 30 are clearly traceable back to international travel, but in other states there is the sense that community transmission is now underway and you're seeing that um, more exponential growth start in some of those places. A question has come in which is, given that increase in other states, are we considering interstate travel bans as a way to protect South Australia from the spread? Look, I think it's happening nationally, uh, naturally. I mean, I think there has been a massive uh, reduction uh, in non-essential interstate travel as well as uh, international travel. I mean, you just have to go down to the airport. Um, there, there is nobody really travelling unless they need to. And certainly the vice of the AHPPC is that airline travel itself is relatively low risk, but you raise a good point. Um, you know, and this is one of the things that we do need to consider um, is, you know, if we do have vulnerable communities, should we be allowing visitors from outside those areas to go in? So you, you could consider in some parts of the Northern Territory, I know they've been talking about, well, should they be allowing um, teachers to leave communities uh, for the school holidays and then come back in, is this um, a potential source of, of infection? And we would have exactly the same situation on the APY land. So look, it's moving very quickly. It's one of the reasons why the National Cabinet has asked the AHPPC to provide advice with regards to this. It wasn't resolved uh, last night at the meeting. Uh, I'm sure it will be discussed on Friday. Um, at our meeting, uh, but I think that well, there's going to be very, very regular meetings of the National Cabinet going forward. And this will move at pace and the response will move at pace with it. Okay, so on the economic front then, um, a question specifically about the higher education sector. So Karen, you talked about the immediate response of many of these institutions um, and a little bit about the long term as well. Have you got a point of view on what the sector should be doing in the long term to increase its resilience to events like this in future? Look, I think what um, the last few weeks has revealed is where there are gaps in terms of data and processes. Um, so that's going to really um, highlight uh, where future areas of focus and I think also um, crisis management, obviously responses. But I think the, the overall reputation of the sector and how they're handling it in terms of the, stu the duty of care for students will become quite critical. Uh, through the Global Reputation Task Force, we have actually rec uh, made 18 recommendations to the Minister for Education to consider um, going long term. So everything from crisis response to communication to policy, um, you know, your flexibility around that. The, the Premier uh, referenced the, the change in terms of the working hours from 40 to 80 a fortnight, I think it was, and that's, I would assume that's actually uh, taking into account the fact that a lot of international students who are studying things like nursing, they are restricted by working hours um, when they're on a student visa. So, um, yeah, I haven't seen the detail of that, but that's possibly to allow those student nurses to now support, you know, provide that support in the um, health system. So that flexibility and regulation is actually going to be very important. So I think overall, you know, our reputation is what... The things in our control, so our communication, the... the um, Consistency of communication and that duty of care will actually um, is, is what's in our control in terms of the long term. Um, and I, I know we and other uh, destination marketing agencies are 
you know, we're very much focused on that, um, uh, the uh, relationships we have with our stakeholders, so offshore education agents, supporting them. They're, they're, they're continuing with their recruitment efforts. In fact, China is now actually starting to kind of get back to business. Staff are back in the office, but they're still looking at those um, online or digital engagement strategies for recruiting students. So we have to then figure out how we can provide them with the, t the tools that they need. Hmm. Can we broaden that question out to other sectors? We've had a question come in, which is what good ideas, business practice changes, new products, responses, regulate, regulatory adjustments have we seen in other sectors, which we think might stay post COVID-19 and become the new normal? Any takers on that question? Can, can I just build briefly on, on the question before, because it flows out to that. We've got both supply chain disruption and in a sense, demand chain disruption mm. as well. And I think we'll all need to sit down afterwards and say, well, actually during and yes, going forward now. immediately, right. how do we, and it's not easy, how do we generate new baskets for our, for our exports of goods and services? Uh, um, we've got one very big basket, which, which Australia and South Australia has, has uh, relied upon, but we need to think about broadening that. We also, as we respond to the fact that a lot of the things that we've assumed the global supply chain will give us in events like this, obviously they don't. So there's a new conversation about what we need to manufacture in this country and that's a healthy conversation. It's not a, a return to some silly protectionism. It's like um, we as a community need to think not only about the economic cost of these but the social and the security and the national sovereign um, requirements to have certain products to be uh, manufactured in, in Australia. So I think those conversations are important and I, and I assume that they will be kicking off as we f see this supply day chain disruption uh, manifest itself in actual practical things that are occurring now. So we've now cranked up an old factory in, in Victoria. I think the Army's um, crewing it up to start remanufacturing masks. That may become, or some successor to that may become a permanent fixture, as will other things which, which we deem to be national requirements going forward. So I think that's a big conversation to have. Again, hopefully it'll be a mature one. We don't want to pay more than necessary for things. Uh, we don't want to uh, disrupt international trade. I think it, we, we need to remind ourselves that international trade is of fundamental value to Australia in particular, but we need to understand the lessons we're learning from this experience. And that's indeed a direct question that's come in, so thank you for answering that, which is how important is the maintenance of local manufacturing capability for health products and services in event of this global pandemic? Given that was a specific question, did anyone else want to make a comment on that, local manufacturing capability? I just certainly think there will be a greater focus going forward about sort of uh, making sure that we just do have those baseline capabilities mm. that are scalable at mm. times when mm. we uh, need them. Um, I think this has really shone, shone a light uh, on some of our vulnerabilities, um, but uh, I'm really impressed with the response. Um, it sort of seems to be an Australian thing when you're given a, a complex task and you've got your back to the wall, um, there can be some extraordinary efforts. Uh, and I've already seen that in South Australia as we prepare for that peak. Uh, and I think we'll see that in, in manufacturing. And, and just, look, there's obviously going to be, as we get through this, and we definitely will get through it, uh, we'll sit down, we'll learn the lessons from this, and we'll make sure that we're prepared uh, for the inevitability of other uh, you know, shocks to our system going forward. Chris, a question for you directly. Um, people on the panel have mentioned the fact that many businesses um, are enacting their business continuity plans, things are changing, people are working from home, they are taking steps to enact social distancing. Um, what are the likely legal implications for organisations that don't respond in an appropriate manner? That's the question that's come in. I guess it really depends um, what the consequences um, end up being um, of, of uh, uh, of not enacting um, business continuity um, issues such as working from home. I mean, I, at the moment there's no, there's no imperative uh, for, for working from home. Um, businesses uh, obviously have to operate in an environment at the moment of, of what is practically and economically um, appropriate and reasonable for them. Um, so, uh, I mean, ultimately if there was a legal issue around that, um, I guess uh, the standard of care that applied to them 
um, in a legal sense uh, would, would not necessarily be an expectation that you should have people working from home. Um, you'd have to look at the circumstances of how it occurred, the transmission occurred, if that's what we're talking about, uh, and determine whether there's been any sort of uh, breach of, of their uh, duty of care to their employees. Um, it, it would be pretty much a, an individual circumstance uh, situation at the moment because we don't, we don't have any um, specific standard around uh, requiring businesses to have, for instance, um, employees working from home. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a sensible measure uh, to adopt if you can, but it's not always practical economically for any business to, uh, uh, to simply have all their workforce or part of their workforce working from home. And obviously that applies to those who are employed by someone else, but there's a question that's come in around self-employment and the protection of the self-employed from an economic perspective. So the Singapore government offers self-employed people 100 Singapore dollars per day. Um, how are governments here considering supporting self-employed people whose businesses are impacted significantly by the virus? Premier, sorry, I think that goes to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, look, Singapore falls further down the track and they're seeing the implications earlier. I've got to say, in South Australia, we announced our initial immediate economic stimulus uh, last week where we were, um, if you like, getting ahead of our state budget, which comes down in a few uh, months' time, because we know that there are going to be significant implications on employment. Uh, and so we tried to think, well, what are the jobs that we can bring forward as quickly as possible? Uh, the federal government followed that uh, only a few days afterwards and talked about direct injection. There were a number of things that they considered. Uh, one which was particularly welcome was uh, some wage subsidy for people doing apprenticeships, because I think it's really good, important that we come out of this with our skill base uh, in place. We don't want to deteriorate or damage our skill base going forward for the inevitable um, increase in demand which will come after we've dealt with this uh, virus. There was the accelerated uh, depreciation. There were some cash payments but they were limited because I think the recent experience has been that um, more money can often not lead to stimulus but paying down debt uh, and actually uh, saving at a time when we do need uh, economic stimulus. And there was also some cash payments to small businesses um, because when we look at the balance sheets of businesses in Australia, to be quite honest, our larger businesses and our banks are, probably have the strongest balance sheets uh, going at the moment globally. Uh, where the fragility uh, exists is with our smaller businesses, in particular yeah. those around cash flow. So there are payments if it gets through um, Federal Parliament next week of 25, up to $25,000 uh, an immediate payment to assist with the cash flow that is all designed uh, to keep people employed uh, through this six month period. Now, having said that, that was last Thursday's stimulus. <laughs> um, we've already seen speculation that there will be further uh, stimulus as we come to grips uh, with exactly what the implications of this virus are going to be on the economy. Um, I think um, nearly all uh, jurisdictions, and I certainly don't want to speak for other premiers or chief ministers, but I think most people appreciate that um, the lofty ambition of um, you know, balanced or surplus budgets is going to come under real pressure. Uh, we've already given up that quest uh, in South Australia for this year and for next year. Um, our primary responsibility is to well resource the health response, but then secondly, and also very importantly, making sure that we can uh, buffer the inevitable economic consequences and employment consequences of the, uh, the coronavirus. And I think this is the logical thing to do. Um, you know, the Reserve Bank Governor, Dr Philip Lowe, has been very clear that we're sort of coming to the uh, end of the useful life of monetary policy at the moment uh, with interest rates, the official interest rate uh, where it is at the moment at 0.5%. There's speculation it will go down to 0.25%. But below that, there's negligible evidence that there's going to be um, any benefit. We've seen speculation about QE and other supports that might come from the Reserve Bank. But I think now um, the fiscal stimulus is possibly the, the most useful and that's when the federal and the state governments need to be working together. So as I said, from South Australia's perspective, uh, we got out early, we brought forward an, an immediate uh, economic stimulus designed to create jobs immediately, not in six, nine or 12 months time, but now. Uh, and um, you know, uh, the federal government stimulus I think to date is in excess of $20 billion that they've announced. 
and I think that there's uh, much more to come. And there was a question that's come into exactly that point, which was, as we see this play out over months and months, where would the governments at various levels of government get the funds to keep the economy alive and for how long? And I guess to answer that question, in short, it's we're comfortable that we're not heading to be back in the black and that we will live with the consequences of that. Yeah, and, and just to make the point that, you know, we are very fiscally responsible in Australia. We can all whinge and whine about uh, certain aspects of uh, our uh, national debt and our uh, fiscal decisions, but overall, we are you know very fiscally responsible in Australia. We've got a solid uh, balance sheet, and we're you know amongst the very uh, best nations in the world to be able to respond to this because of the work which has been done uh, in the past. This is exactly and precisely why we've worked hard in Australia uh, to have that uh, that strength, so that we can respond and get through uh, an issue exactly like we're confronting at the moment. And a question then off the back of that perhaps for Mark, which has come through, is do you think business and trade is relying too heavily on government in these circumstances um, for the major dis disruptions that we're experiencing? Um, what happened to businesses having their own insurances and business continuity plans? I guess that's what's the appropriate role for government versus business at a time like this? And I, and I guess if you, if you want to use uh, a, a wartime analogy, the role of government expands or contracts depending on the challenge. And... There's no way that we can just let the airline industry collapse because they, regardless of what their preparation was, on the other side of this, we're a country that relies on tourism, yeah. and we have to have a uh, we have to have a competitive airline industry. So, from my point of view, there's things the government will do in the next few days and weeks which you wouldn't dream of uh, in in a stable state. But the, but the government's fundamental responsibility is to hold the economy together when it's hit with an impact like this. Um, Sorry, the fundamental thing is to keep its citizens alive and safe and healthy, and the and a healthy economy is critical to that. So, so I think the role of government is a function of the, of the circumstances that it is in. Um, so, I think we haven't got time to debate the the ideology of, of how big government should be right now, because I think the better thing to think about here is if we overshoot. Let's overshoot and come back quickly, which they're show the governments are showing the flexibility to move at that speed. If I'd much rather overshoot a little bit right now and come back a bit from that than undershoot now and have that regret that we didn't move fast enough or we didn't move big enough. So I think the debate about the role of the size of government right now is like third tier. Not where we need to be. No, no we don't need it right now because the, because the government's showing an un... An, an, uh, uh, <laughs> an unusually high level of intelligence collectively and it's relying very heavily and responding very uh, openly to expert advice on an ongoing basis. I can't recall a time when the, the country's federal and state governments have operated at this level of sophistication. Noting as well that this is the second of the crises that we've faced this year um, and a question has come in around the interplay of this with the impacts of the bushfire. Um, that's probably got multiple elements to it. One is the government's response to both of those things, but the specific question that's been asked is about um, the loans that were provided in the bushfire context. Now, there will obviously be other programs of grants and loans. Um, the specific question is what happens to the economy if all of those businesses are unable to repay those loans? Can I, can I just respond again? Uh, um, the, the question about how the government deals with loans and how they modify for that effect. So if we go back to my early comment, the most important thing for us to do now is not worry about statistics about short-term performance, what happened this quarter and what happened next quarter. The most important thing is that we deliver a functional economic structure as best as we can protect it going through. And if businesses that th through the policy responses we're, we're implementing now to deal with the virus find themselves in trouble, then we ask the question about whether they should be paying interest on loans. We ask the question whether we forgive loans. I think these are questions, I, as, as we get there, we have to say what is the way of protecting the, the economy rolling forward and the governments are demonstrating to today that they will make the right decision. So I think I, think I walked around Adelaide yesterday, I spoke to two small businesses. The, the the small business community, the, the downside of working from home is they've got no customers. It's immediate. It is immediate. They're going, are we opening today? And, and I'm saying to them, um, 
I feel your pain, but this is a collective responsibility here and we need you to be up and running on the other side of this. So I have a, a, a hunch that the governments are going to work through this so that we don't have a mass destruction of small businesses because we'll have a, a much longer tail of much higher unemployment and economic suffering if we let that happen. And I think the Premier is absolutely right. We've spent, we've spent through the Hawke-Keating governments and the Howard Costello governments and since then, uh, fiscally, this, this country is capable of digging deep now at a public level. I think the disadvantage we've got is that at an economic level, the, the country from the drought and uh, the, the fires and also the economic cycle, we come into this at a relatively low um, point, but we need to take that into account. Uh, it's all the more important it's, it's all the value about all those years of, of building a good fiscal basis that we can actually respond. This is exactly why you would do something like we've done in the last 30 years. We've rebuilt the economy and we've rebuilt the public sector finances to be able to absorb a lot of this. Thank you. Any other comments on that from the rest of the panel? If not, I might move back to this question of the spread and flattening the curve because we do have a lot of um, questions that are coming in around that as well. Um, specifically in relation to the additional restriction that was announced this morning around indoor gatherings of 100 people or more. Um, the question's come in about how will those non-essential indoor gatherings be controlled? Will pubs, bars, restaurants, sporting events only be allowed to have 100 people come inside? Will there be fines and punishments for this? I mean, it was announced this morning, so it's probably too early for there to be official protocols in place. Premier, I'm very conscious of that. Um, but given that, you know, you've mentioned SAPO have a role in the enforcement of self-quarantine for travellers, do you envisage that there will be a role for enforcement around the size of these gatherings as well? Look, there definitely will be enforcement. So each state and territory, and as of this morning, the Commonwealth have enacted their sort of highest level framework for dealing with this. In South Australia, we uh, declared a public health emergency on Sunday. This morning, the Governor-General uh, declared a biosecurity uh, emergency. That's uh, the highest level at the, at the federal, at uh, the Commonwealth uh, level. So um, we now have extraordinary powers uh, to make sure that we can protect uh, the population. And if, if an order is given, uh, it is an offence uh, to essentially operate uh, outside of that order. So at the moment, um, for example, at airports, when people are arriving, they would be given a verbal uh, or a written order that they need to self-isolate. If they are not doing that, it is an offence. There are penalties. They escalate. Now, with regards to indoor versus outdoor and mass gatherings, um, we had some uh, an announcement on Sun, uh, sorry, on, on Friday last mm -hmm. week that um, non-essential mass gatherings above 500 mm -hmm. wouldn't be permitted as of Monday this week. What the National Cabinet did last night was receive the advice from the AHPPC that we needed to have a differential between outdoor events where there is a much lower level risk of uh, community transmission compared with indoor events and in particular those indoor events that are essentially static where you might have a large number of people sitting in close proximity for an extended period of time. Now there needs to be some thought uh, given to a period of time, uh, the social uh, distancing, static versus uh, non-static, and we're going to work to provide that clarity as quickly as possible. But the overarching theme of this is reducing risk and providing some, if you like, direction to people about uh, reducing risk. But people can use common sense, and quite frankly, they already are. I've seen it already. You know, just in a social setting, people aren't shaking hands anymore. They're not hugging uh, and kissing. Uh, they're wiping down hard surfaces on a regular basis. They're washing their hands, um, either with soap uh, and water or with hand uh, sanitizer. When they are coughing, they're really distancing themselves from people or coughing into the crook of their arm or coughing into a tissue and then disposing of that. These are all sensible things. And I've been very impressed uh, by the vast majority of Australians who have said, this is sensible, uh, this is what uh, I'm going to uh, be doing. But uh, if you look at what's happening in other parts of the world, there are even uh, more stringent restrictions uh, that have already been put in place. It's not to say we, there won't be 
uh, further restrictions put in place uh, down the track. But at the moment, the AHPBC uh, advice is clear. It's been accepted by the National Cabinet. Now we're just working through the detailed guidelines to, to give to people. But uh, I do emphasise that this is not going to be um, something that people can choose uh, to accept or not accept. Uh, these are mandatory new restrictions. You not only put your own uh, health at risk, but you put the health of other citizens at risk during these times. That's why a public health emergency is being uh, called, and that's why we've put in abilities to enforce those new orders. Rowan, can I just add to the, add to that? Um, it's quite interesting that a lot of a lot of businesses and industries. Uh, are actually being very proactive already about uh, no face-to-face -face meetings. Mm. If business can be done over the phone, it's now being done over the phone, and, and that's been taking place now uh, probably for, for weeks mm. uh, in terms of proactivity around that. So I think the population is, the business population is certainly uh, starting to respond to that in a very proactive mm. way uh, without, without formal uh, measures. So conscious of time, we've probably got four or so minutes left. Um, and there's a question that's come in that's quite at odds with the rest of the tone of the questions, and I think it is worth asking, which is in this context, what do we think are the big opportunities for South Australia? Um, it strikes the questioner that if there ever there was a time to do things differently, this is the time, and South Australia is well placed to do so. Perhaps if we finish with a final comment from everybody on that topic. Certainly, I called the IT sector uh, together, some leaders in some of our largest organisations and government departments on Monday, and not so much looking at opportunities, but what, were, what was going to happen uh, and how could we actually come out of this stronger by adopting new uh, practices, uh, encouraging people to work from uh, home. You know, what are the things that we can do that make us stronger? Uh, one of the things that I also put to them uh, was that we had seen with our own uh, data that there was an increase um, level of uh, threat and attacks on our data coincident with the rise of the coronavirus and that we were very concerned uh, about, uh, if you like, these phishing ex expeditions where people would get a message in their inbox saying, inbox saying, you know, coronavirus important message and people are opening it and they're, they're really at a vulnerable mm. state as more and more people are working with you know, via a VPN at home. So there is an opportunity, I think, to massively improve our cyber preparedness uh, and security uh, in South Australia and across Australia, quite frankly, and come out of this more resilient on the other side. Thank you. Karen, thoughts from you? Yeah, I think, um, I think where we have those strengths uh, that emerge through this actually can, can flow into um, the educational programs that we can deliver in the future and our ability to attract students here. Um, very much how we come through, uh, how we're handling this situation will go, as I said earlier, to that uh, safety of, of how Australia is viewed as a safe destination will, I think, is going to be very much heightened. Um, uh, you know, things, the, the drivers for students choosing to study somewhere and, and leaving their country are things like, is it a safe and attractive destination to study? Can I study what I want? You know, does it have the course for me? Uh, and can I get some employment opportunities and maybe migrate there? So if there are sentiments again around um, Australia is an attractive place to potentially live, um, what are those migration policy mm -hmm. settings that we can look at as well? So I think all of that is in play and um, I think you know, all of Australia um, really needs to stay mindful of, its, of this reputation going forward. Mm. Thank you. Mark, 30 seconds on the opportunity okay. space. Um, supply chain review and what the opportunities are for us. Um, I think um, really we're going to test out uh, digital communication technology and flexible working and we, we might have six months of really understanding how that adds value uh, and then reviewing uh, nationally and internationally what our communication and transport needs are. I think on the other side of this we're going to say hopefully in that six months we've learned a lot about how to communicate without actually needing to fly mm -hmm. halfway across the world to talk to someone or halfway across the country for that matter. Coags meeting in Perth, that might be a thing of the past. Well, that'd be a relief for some. <laughs> um, Michael, any opportunities? Um, I think from a from medical research, research perspective, we need to be prepared. Preparedness. I mean, um, this will happen again, and we need to be able to move quickly uh, and effectively. Uh, and that is happening at, at, at some level, but we could do a lot better with that. 
And finally, Chris. And finally. Um, oh, look, I, I think that um, the relationship of the community with the health system is actually going to be significantly improved and significantly closer um, after this uh, pandemic is over and, it, and it's been dealt with. Um, I think that that will be a significant improvement. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. I'm conscious of time. It is now 11.30. Um, it's very strange without anyone in the room to say please join me in thanking the panel. But I would like to, on behalf of CEDA, thank our panel. Chris Sweet, Karen Kent, Mark Duffy, Michael Beard, and finally the Premier of South Australia, Stephen Marshall. Thank you very much for making the time to join us today. CEDA is a trusted and reliable source of information in a world of potentially fake news. It's really important that we can keep those lines of communication open through our live stream events. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you.